Chinese fortune cookie says we're living in interesting times and certainly it applies to um, work which is so important such an important part of everyone's lives and the ways in which work is changing the way I like to think about it talk about it uh, is that we're living sort of in a perfect storm as you know a perfect storm is one which comes from the collision or conversions of multiple storms in, um, and that's what seems to be happening here because there are three or four trends which are powerful in themselves and they're now colliding so one of them is a quite a long-term trend um, away from jobs towards uh, flexible arrangements leading to much more gig work, self-employment, etc. I think the idea of stable jobs and companies leading to stable, predictable careers is becoming you know, obsolete and relevant to fewer and fewer people. There are multiple reasons for this. One is because the environment is so uncertain and turbulent, most organizations, employers are trying to become more fl flexible in the sense of having a small core of permanent employees and then different types of arrangements using vendors, subcontractors, consultants, even gig work to access talent and get other things done. And, you know, I see this only uh, a trend that's only accelerating and which means, again, more, more of us will have to figure out sooner rather than later how to be self-employed or an entrepreneur. Then comes COVID. Right? And COVID has completely, profoundly changed the nature of at least knowledge work. So one of the things that uh, COVID has shown uh, possible is remote work or virtual work. And it says, at least for some kinds of work, you can do this perfectly well for long periods of time. Um, and that's unlocking a huge amount of opportunity and potential, bo both for employers as well as individuals. The other thing that COVID did is got many of us re-examining our life priorities and where does work fit in in the scheme of other life priorities. And many of us learned how to better integrate work and life. And having tasted that and seen that you can be reasonably productive, there's a reluctance to go back to another extreme. Right? So the world has changed in profound ways. Now, this doesn't apply if you are a frontline worker, right? If you're a sanitation worker or nurse or whatever, it's very, very much required that you be on premise. But for a lot of other uh, kinds of information work, knowledge work, the world has changed. I'd say a third huge trend is supply demand mismatches. So we're living in an interesting time where on aggregate in most parts of the world and you should this doesn't apply to america it doesn't apply to some western european countries or japan uh, there's way more job seekers than there are jobs what we've done is actually a reasonable job in these countries of educating many more people uh, but there isn't enough formal employment so you've got a huge amount of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment across Africa, across Latin America, across South Asia, Southeast Asia. But at the same time, for specific skills, particularly hot skills, there's a, the demand is infinite compared to the supply. So any of these tech jobs, right? Anything to do with AI and machine learning and digital transformation and all that stuff, red hot. Um, and people are, you know, in a happy, happy place because they get multiple offers. Uh, even for other functions, you know, competence is hard to find. You want to find a top-notch comms person or HR person today in Bangalore, you know, you've got your, <laughs> you're going to have a challenge. So there's a big supply demand gap for hot skills, specific skills, but even that is dynamic. Um, you know, that was hot six months ago, but right now the world is in recession. Even large companies like, you know, Google and Facebook are quietly laying off people. You've got uh, um, a, a venture capital winter. Uh, okay, so, so startups are being very, very tough on um, employment. So this, this is a dynamic situation, but that's kind of interesting. The last thing I talk about is, look, for at least 20 years, too many employers, not all, but 
many have been very, very transactional in terms of how they've approached talent. Yeah, they talk a good story on talent and all that. But when you actually look at how people are treated, employees are treated, it's not at all inspiring. Okay. And they don't have effective people managers. They can look up to guide them, coach them. Um, There isn't real commitment. There's a lot of, you know, hiring, firing, transactional nature. And the result is, I think we have bred a generation of mercenaries. Okay. Why should I be committed or loyal to my employer when the employer is not? So that's why you're seeing so much mercenary behavior where for 10% more, somebody will, you know, jump ship or somebody will get a job offer, use that to shop around and get something even better. And then on the, uh, the morning of the joining date, they'll say, tough luck, I'm not coming and so on and so forth. Really bad behaviors. But the thing to realize is we bred these behaviors. So what you've got right now um, is all these things coming together and it's manifesting in such a variety of ways that we give names to the great resignation, then that was followed by the great termination, there's quiet quitting, but now there's also quiet sacking, okay, which says, hey, if I find you quietly quitting, I'm going to quietly sack you. So, but frankly, there's nothing all that surprising. It's really a complex interplay of these trends. It's not time to get all panicky, okay? The heavens are not falling. Uh, if you're an employer or company or whatever, it's a time to think quite calmly, deliberately about you know how you want to deal with some of these fundamental trends, which are not going away. Okay, the world has changed, and we're not going back to the past anytime soon. Um, I think the question around has the world seen some of this before is a very interesting one, as there's a famous quote that says. Um, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. So, you know, I spent the first half of my life, actually, I still am very much steeped in the world of industrial companies and manufacturing. And it's right from about 1930 till today, there's been all these trends when applied to labor, Okay. Now what it seems is happening is the same issues are, um, you know, becoming relevant to the world of knowledge work or intellectual work. But these issues are very, very, very familiar to anybody who works in industrial companies. Essentially, you know, when in the early part of the 20th century, most companies think General Motors, Ford, Toyota, etc., used to have what is called a compliance-driven work system, okay? A compliance-driven work system means you break up work into small, small tasks and give it to people. You're essentially looking at labor as hired hands. You don't want them thinking or doing anything creative, just hired hands putting together uh, parts or manufacturing things, et cetera. There are very clear rules of behavior, what you can, can't do. Um, And there's a very clear hierarchy where senior management speaks down to management, which speaks down to the workers. You got into two issues. One is employees started ganging up as unions and pushing back against some of these practices saying, look, we're human. We want to be treated as humans. We want more control of our our decisions, more autonomy over our lives, etc. And so you had this unionization. The other thing that happened is some companies like Toyota figured out a much better way to organize work. And the, today we call these commitment-driven work systems where they said, look, the employee is a talent. We just don't want hired hands. We also want their minds. We want their whole person there solving problems, being creative, taking initiative, et cetera all within a box, okay? So you don't get to think about the CEO's job. You get to think about your job in a lot of creative ways. And so they created a whole different approach to work uh, with a lot more empowerment 
and a lot more reward sharing in the success of the organization, et cetera. And so these got called high performance, high commitment systems. And what people began to realize is you can drive productivity up even faster when your whole workforce is all in. And so then gradually American and European companies started emulating this. The sad thing though is the revolution in manufacturing has not gone far enough. There are still a large number, maybe even a majority of firms which are st still stuck in the old paradigm of adversarial relations with employees. And you can see that playing out today in companies like Amazon where the employees in the warehouses are rebelling and organizing to demand better conditions, fairer conditions, et cetera. Now it strikes me that the same issues and the same choice is available for organizations in the world of knowledge work. You have two ways to deal with the trends I talked about. Can you, should you go down the compliance path or do you go down the commitment path? So now some employers are saying, look, this remote work, we've had enough, okay? People are goofing off, they're moonlighting. We need to see them in the office at least three days a week, better yet, five days a week, okay? Why are they saying that? Because they don't know how to measure the productivity of knowledge workers. So they, we confuse presence or attendance and activity with productivity, okay? And employees are pushing back. They're saying, hey, how is this more productive? I'm actually more productive working from home. Okay. I'm getting more done. I come here and then I'm supposed to get on a Zoom call. How much sense does that make? Okay. Or I come here and it's a noisy open floor and people are chatting. Some, somebody's coming up and saying hi when I'm in the middle of concentrating. This is not productive. So you got this clash. Okay. Uh, other employers are saying, look, I'm going to use technology to clamp down on this aberrant behavior. So I'm going to look at employee emails and see who's doing funny stuff. I'm going to look at who's applying for jobs on LinkedIn. I'm going to see who's got out there and on social media saying things, stirring things up or moonlighting and so forth. And I'm going to use all the, this technology to actually monitor and clamp down on human behavior. It sounds like an Amazon warehouse, okay? So I think that's the path that some companies are choosing or thinking about going down. Yet others are trying to say, look, maybe there's a better approach. How do we go down the high performance, high commitment pathway? Now this is hard to do, okay? Because what it means is you have to connect your company purpose with employees' ambitions, okay? That's not, a, that's easy to say, hard to do. You have to give them people managers who are at least competent, if not inspiring, forget inspiring, competent, fair, you know, will be there for you. You've got to figure out how to measure productivity, okay? And which is why some of these new things like OKRs become so interesting because it allows the employee and the manager to get aligned around out puts and outcomes instead of activity. Okay, now you both can talk about things in the same way and you can decide is Ravi doing a good job or not doing a good job, regardless of you know, where I am or how many hours I'm pretending to be working. So this is all very different and it's a lot of hard work. So it's much easier to go down the compliance path. But ultimately, I think it'll be more rewarding both in productivity terms, in terms of being able to attract, retain, inspire talent, if you go down this high commitment pathway. So this is, I think, the fundamental choice that's ahead of all employers, whether it's private sector, social sector, public sector. <laughs> and it's got very different sort of uh, implications and consequences. In the 1960s, there was a guy called Douglas McGregor who did a beautiful piece of work and wrote a beautiful book, which is even more relevant today than 60 years ago. And it's called The Human Side of Enterprise. And he said, look, there are two theories that we hold about human motivation. So theory X is where you believe people really don't want to work. 
okay? They're sh given half a chance, they'll dodge it, shirk, okay, take shortcuts, etc. And therefore, they need to be managed. They need to be supervised. You need to check up, follow up on them. You need to use carrot and stick and reward bad behavior and, no, sorry, good behavior and punish bad behavior, etc. And basically, you have to treat them as infants. Then there's a theory why, which says, look, that is not true for the majority of individuals. There are a few who are like that, but most people actually want to do good work, want to be responsible. They want to learn. They want to take on more things. They want to progress. And the way you do that is very different. Okay. You give them broad objectives and a lot of autonomy over how they actually achieve it. Your job as a manager is not to micromanage and supervise, but to provide feedback and coaching. Okay. And the rewards are not just transactional monetary rewards, but also primarily in terms of progression and learning. So he said, look, we, we, there are these two different theories of motivation. And we, depending on which theory you believe, you would design your work system completely differently. I think this is so relevant today. If you believe, sure, there are a bunch of people who are irresponsible, don't wish to be here, et cetera, but they are a minority. Then what you do is you don't design the work system for the minority. You design it for the, the good majority, but have an effective mechanism for detecting aberrant behavior and dealing with it. Because if you don't deal with it, then it's a cancer that spreads and you become toxic. And the key to this is you need to be able to measure productive outcomes, which is not so easy in intellectual work or creative work. See, if you're making widgets in a factory, then you can count how many widgets did Ravi make this hour? And it's a very objective number. Okay. And therefore, was I productive, less productive? Okay. But if you're writing software, it's very much more difficult because you can't count something simple like the lines of code. Because a good programmer will actually accomplish the task with more elegant code, fewer lines of code. Okay. You can't measure it in terms of number of hours you spent at the desk again. So you need it's much harder to measure productivity of knowledge work, creative work, et cetera. But just means that it's a harder task. We have to apply ourselves to that. One of the more promising things that I've seen tools come out for measuring productive work is the system called objectives and key results, OKRs, which I think is catching on quite well. It's not a panacea, but it seems like a very useful way to think about what outcomes do you want and so that you can leave the means uh, flexible and up to, the, uh, up to individuals. Very interesting things over the last couple of years has been in the companies I'm associated with, um, there's been high attrition, okay? And so you begin to do some analytics on the data. So first of all, you look at good attrition versus bad attrition. Bad attrition is people you don't want to leave leaving. And then you say, can I look at the attrition by manager? And can I also look at a couple other data points to the extent you measure employee engagement? Can I look at it by manager? Can I look at results of, of some sort, performance by manager? <clears throat> then you find something really interesting. There's huge variation, okay? In the same organization for roughly the same type of work, same city, you'll find some managers with very low attrition and very high engagement scores and others who have very high attrition. It's certainly eye-opening and reinforcing for me because it says that the role of the people manager has become very central, no longer just derided as a postman, a mailman who passes around messages between senior and frontline. <clears throat> For most employees, their experience of work 
is profoundly shaped by who they work for, this people manager. And if you're lucky, you've got someone who's fair, who has interest in you, who's you know, coaching and developing you, giving you opportunities to grow, learn, um, contribute, okay? And creating a you know, environment of reasonable trust or even a little bit of fun. And then there are highly toxic managers, okay? And everybody tries to flee them. And this is where the quiet quitting is going on and so forth. <clears throat> so if you're an organization, you need to really be able to identify and categorize your people managers in which of these two large pools they fit in. What I think companies need to do is learn to hold people managers accountable for their people outcomes, not just their results. recent piece of work that Microsoft has put out, which has a lot of uh, data around this issue. And it, the data points out that the main reason to come to work is not work. It's people. Okay. Because we're a social animal, because we, ha we have this high need to engage and interact uh, with, with others. Okay, and that's one of the greatest joys that a workplace should offer. Okay, but we haven't consciously always thought about how to make it fun and engaging. Um, and as a result, now that employees have tasted, employees have tasted an alternative way, they're saying, look, I can actually get work done remotely or whatever. And then for my, I'll have my real communities elsewhere. When I was running a factory in America in the 80s, okay, the, my employees used to come in wearing t-shirts that said, thank God it's Friday. I live for Fridays, okay, and stuff. And they'd be really grumpy on Monday morning because they were, didn't want to be there. As a supervisor, I used to go out and bring donuts on Monday morning because that would ease the pain a little bit. But they didn't want to be there and they did the barest minimum and they saw work as only one thing, a paycheck. And they find meaning, purpose, fun, all that elsewhere. Okay. It seems like we've got the same issue going on in many workplaces today. These are not fun places. People are there only because they want the money or need the money and they're going to solve for other things that they need elsewhere. There's a big, big opportunity to connect these. I think the fundamental choice for employers is what kind of a work system do I want to have? Do I want to drive productivity through compliance and use technology for that? Or do I want to drive productivity and results by creating a high commitment work system and use technology for that, okay? And these two are incompatible and both can work. You know, there are some, you know, you look at Amazon, they're very much down the compliance path and they've been phenomenally successful. So you can be very successful doing either. The worst is to get caught in the middle where you dither and you're neither this nor that, okay? and you're treating everybody the same, uh, you're building a low trust system, but then using exotic techniques like special chefs and menus to draw people into the organization, pandering to them and doing all that, it's a mess. So I'd say be clear, pick either that is consistent with your belief system and go down that. Don't get stuck in the middle and dither. <laughs>